Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Dear participants, Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all of you. Um, I am pleased to welcome you to the 6th Biennial ICON Conference 2022 at the Indus Hospital and Health Network. Uh, my name is Dr. Hanya Naveed and I am Registrar Histopathology at Indus Hospital um, and Health Network and I will be moderating this session. Um, I will introduce our guest shortly, um, but before we proceed any further, I'd like to um, start the session by the recitation of the Holy Quran. اللہ کے نام سے شروع جو نہائیت مہربان ہمیشہ رحم فرمانے والا ہے اے نبی مقدم آپ فرما دیجئے وہ اللہ ہے جو یکتا ہے اللہ سب سے بے نیاز سب کی پناہ اور سب پر فائق ہے نہ اس سے کوئی پیدا ہوا ہے اور نہ ہی وہ پیدا کیا گیا ہے اور نہ ہی اس کا کوئی ہم سر ہے The talks today, uh, in, the, in the today's session are focused on the diagnostic difficulties and updates in hematolymphoid pathology. Um, we have three presenters today. Two of them are from uh, Khan University Hospital, Karachi, and one is from Shifa International Hospital, Islamabad. Um, we're going to take uh, the presentations first, and the question answer session will be um, at the end after uh, all of the three presentations. So if you have any question, you can write them in the question answer um, uh, chat and then we can um, ask them at the in the end uh, the uh, first, first of all the first uh, presentation is from dr shahid parvez dr shahid parvez is a professor and senior consultant histopathologist at akhan university hospital karachi his major diagnostic and research interests include hematopathology uh, hygienic pathology and predictive immunohistochemistry. He has supervised several PhD and FCPS students and published over 225 peer-reviewed publications and several book chapters. He is also the editor of a comprehensive color atlas of diagnostic and predictive histopathology, the second edition of which is being published by the world's largest publisher, Springer Nature. He has been elected as the counselor CPSP for a term of 2019 till 2023, he is also the country advisor for Royal College of Pathologists UK. He played a pivotal role in establishing vibrant and active pathology forums and is the founder president of International Academy of Pathology IEP Pakistan Division, founder president of Histopathology and Cytology Society of Pakistan and Sark Academy of Cytology and Histopathology. Dr. Parvez also played a pivotal role to revive Karachi Cancer Registry and is the chair of Karachi Cancer Registry. He is on the editorial board of several prestigious journals and has been listed as the Productive Scientist of Pakistan by Pakistan Council of Science and Technology. He is going to give a talk on diagnostic challenges in small B-cell lymphoma. Thank you so much for, for taking out the time for this presentation. You can start the presentation now. My sincere thanks to the organizer of uh, this workshop and this icon 2022 organized by indus in particular my uh, sincere thanks to dr noshin yakub so in this i elected to talk about diagnostic challenges in small b cell lymphomas i mean this is a topic obviously which uh, is very comprehensive and cannot be covered in 20 minutes which are allocated to me however i will try to encompass as much as possible by using three of my cases so let's start with the first case so this was a 54 year old male who presented with cervical lymphadenopathy way back in 2012. Other symptoms included fever, generalized weakness, no significant weight loss, past medical history was unremarkable, and on examination, no hepatosplenomegaly was noted. Now, resection of the lymph node was performed and sent for 
histopathological evaluation to a local lab in Karachi, other than our Khan AKU lab, and a diagnosis of SLL with classic Hodgkin's lymphoma was made. So dual pathology. The medical oncologist who encountered this diagnosis for the first time sent the biopsy blocks to our lab for second opinion as it was for the first time for him to encounter such a uh, diagnosis. So he was confused. So this is the low power HNE, and you can see that uh, lymph node is replaced by these small monomorphic cells. And amidst this, you may recognize these large atypical cells, right? These ones. If I go to higher magnification, you see that uh, these are the small cells. When we say small cells, we compare the nucleus of this cell to the nucleus of histiocytes. For example, probably this is a histiocyte. So the size of these cells is smaller than histiocytes. So histiocyte nucleus is the benchmark to call it a small cell, medium size cell or large cell so please don't use the endothelial cells as a benchmark because depending uh, of the interaction of uh, various cytokines they may sometimes becomes very large and here you see these large atypical cells certainly hodgkin like cells and on immunostochemistry, CD20 is diffuse positive in those small cells. CD3 is negative, right? Obviously, there is uh, some residual T cell, uh, native T cell infiltrate present in the lymph node. And this is CD5. CD5 is a T cell marker. However, in some uh, a small B cell lymphomas, it comes positive, right? So here CD5 is like CD20 rather than CD3. Cyclone D1, negative and nice uh, built in control. You know, cyclone D1 express normally brightly in endothelial cells, right? So it's negative. Ki67 or MIV1 is low. Now coming to these those large atypical cells, you see they do show Golgi positivity. Right? Golgi means uh, paranuclear positivity. CD15 also show membrane positivity and Golgi positivity in those large Hodgkin type cells. LMP1, which is a, a surrogate marker for Epstein Barr virus, and these cells are also strongly LMP1 positive, uh, suggesting that uh, these uh, cells are infected with Epstein Barr virus. So, in summary and review of this biopsy, it shows typical SLL morphology. Uh, with the immunophenotype, which is uh, CD20 positive, 3 negative, 5 positive, 23 was positive, second D1 negative, and low, low KI67. Focally, in those large atypical cells, read the Sternbrock type cells, it typically showed the morphology of uh, Hodgkin type, that is CD30 positive cells, CD15 positive, CD20 was also positive as we know that in about 20 percent cases of hodgkin's lymphoma cd20 comes positive lmp1 positive and pex5 positive however one thing was striking that no typical background of classic hodgkin's lymphoma was seen because in classic hodgkin's lymphoma always we see almost always we see 
inflammatory vector. So that was absent. So did he include it as diagnosed before SLL plus classic Hodgkin's lymphoma? And a small B cell lymphoma leukemia with the Hodgkin cells. So this I have taken from the WHO. Uh, it says in a paragraph at the end of uh, CLL, SLL, that some CLL cases show a scattered EBV positive, as in this case, or sometimes negative reed Sternberg cells in the background of CLL. These cases should not be diagnosed as Hodgkin's lymphoma. The diagnosis of Hodgkin's lymphoma in the setting of CLL require classical reed Sternberg cells in an appropriate background. So that inflammatory typical background was absent here. So basically, Hodgkin-like cells may be seen in a variety of conditions uh, like uh, infectious mononucleosis uh, in many other reactive conditions. However, if we don't take into account its microenvironment, then we are likely to call every other case, you know, as having Hodgkin cells, because these large atypical cells may be seen in a variety of uh, neoplastic and non-neoplastic conditions. So each tumor has two components, and both are important: actual tumor cells and the its microenvironment. And in Hodgkin's lymphoma, this is extreme example where actual tumor cells constitute less than 1%, maybe sometimes 0.1%, uh, and the rest is all microenvironment. And the microenvironment is as important as actual Hodgkin cells. And we also published this case in BMJ case reports that uh, if one is not aware of uh, uh, this caveat, then likely to make a mistake. You know, these uh, Hodgkin cells are anyway B cells. A small B lymphocytic lymphoma obviously is a B cell lymphoma. So it's quite possible that some of the B cells which get infected with the uh, Epstein Barr virus may show uh, enlargement and uh, ATPI and morphology, which is very similar to Hodgkin cells. But the important clue is that for, for diagnosis, even you know, when we uh, interpret the bone marrow in a known case of Hodgkin's lymphoma for a staging purpose, we always look. First, the right, right background for Hodgkin's lymphoma. And only then, if there are Hodgkin type cells are present in that, you know, uh, we call it uh, that bone marrow is involved. Otherwise, as I said, many, many cells in lymph nodes and particularly in bone marrow may look like Hodgkin cells, right? Case two. A 70-year-old male with a history of weakness and weight loss for seven months. On examination, there is hepatosplenomegaly and lymphadenopathy. And in this case, peripheral blood and bone marrow was sent for flow cytometry. And at the same time, bone marrow trephine was sent for histology and immunostrochemistry. So let me start with the flow cytometry. So this is the population which is LCA or CD45 positive, you know, bright LCA positive. And uh, CD79A positive, which is a B cell marker. CD3, you know, almost always uh, you have some intermixed uh, uh, normal uh, uh, CD3 positive T cells. So that's not relevant. CD20 positive. Right? 
diffuse positive. And mind you that CD10 is negative. CD10 is important because another small cell lymphoma, which uh, may uh, shed into the blood, uh, is uh, follicular lymphoma. And follicular lymphoma, follicular lymphomas are CD10 positive. So CD10 negative, CD20 positive. Here again, you see the bright positivity of these neoplastic lymphoid cells to both B cell markers CD19 and CD5. So, you know, if we see a small neoplastic population of lymphoid cells, which is double positive, for B cell marker like CD19 or CD20 as, as CD5, then our differential diagnosis is literally limited to two conditions, two entities that is SLL or CLL and mental cell lymphoma. Right? There are some other conditions like CD5 positive large B cell lymphoma, but there the morphology is different. Again, you see that uh, CD19 and CD22, strong positive, double positive, you know, B, so strong B cell positivity. T cell markers, other T cell markers besides CD5 are negative, like CD3 and CD7. HLA-DR is positive. Myelite markers like 13 and 33 are negative. And there is lambda light chain restriction, right? So this population is CD19 positive and lambda positive. So lambda light chain restriction. So this is a monoclonal population, which means that this is a neoplastic population. Kappa, as you can see, is negative. In a reactive population, you will have a mixture of both kappa and lambda positive cells. TDT negative. FMC7 is a marker which uh, comes positive in a number of uh, entities, but uh, which include mental cell lymphoma, right? So FMC7 is a strong positive, right? And this is the uh, bone marrow trephine. And you can see that these lymphite, these, these aggregates, on low power and this is the higher magnification so these are the monomorphic uh, small lymphoid cells and on cd20 they are highlighted you know uh, predominantly follicular or nodular configuration but also interstitial right and you see that cd5 is as good at cd20 like in flow cytometry and cyclic D1, a strong nu nuclear positive. Hence, the this is a lymphoma which is CD79 A positive, 20 positive, 19 positive, 5 positive, 22 positive, 23 negative, with lambda light chain restriction. And on HNE, you have seen the strong cyclin D1 positivity in the nuclei. So that diagnosis is mental cell lymphoma. Very important because mental cell lymphomas, they tend to recur and they're difficult to cure them. These are some of the salient features. So 1114 translocation, you know, which leads to the overexpression of cyclin D1. So coming to the last case, uh, this was a 54 year old male with a history of weakness, bone marrow sent for flow cytometry, and again, refined for histology and immunostochemistry. Because of my interest in neoplastic hematopathology, I mean, I regularly, um, you know, review and report uh, bone marrow refined with our hematology colleagues, particularly hematology trainees. So this is the population, which is a strong LCA, 
positive in the peripheral in the peripheral blood or i think this was uh, bone marrow this was the bone marrow sample okay now what's the phenotype cd 79 a is strong positive cd 10 negative cd 20 positive 22 is strong positive then cd 22 and there was another marker which is uh i don't know huh so cd19 and cd20 is strong positive you see kappa light chain restriction in the previous case it was lambda light chain restriction cd20 and cd11c double positive right cd11c cd103 and cd25 is strong positive if you know what these markers are for, you know, the diagnosis is already obvious. And this is the uh, bone marrow trephine, which is replaced by uh, neoplastic uh, small cells. And this is the higher magnification. And if uh, uh, you have a, an eye for uh, this uh, uh, kind of morphology, you will... Uh, realize that uh, these are so-called what you call egg fried appearance right and this is again cyclin d1 positive right but this was cd5 negative and some other markers positive so 79 a positive 19 positive 20 positive 22 positive kappa light chain restriction 11 c positive 25 positive, 103 positive, and this was CD5 negative. So this is consistent with hairy cell leukemia. Remember that in about 80% cases of hairy cell leukemia, cyclin D1 comes positive. However, besides other things, and markers like CD11, C, and 25, and 103, one important thing is that they are CD5 negative, while mental cell lymphomas are CD5 positive. So with that, my time is about up. So thank you. And uh, as I said, there are some other examples uh, of small B cell lymphomas uh, involving the blood, lymph nodes, and uh, bone marrow. However, for sake of time, you know, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for such a nice and comprehensive, comprehensive presentation. It is always a pleasure to learn from you. Um, for the audience, if you have any questions, you can please write them in the chat box, and um, I'll ask them after um, all of the three presentations. Um, the next presentation is by Dr. Arsalan Ahmed. Dr. Arsalan Ahmed did his graduation from Dow Medical College, Karachi, Pakistan. He pursued his residency from University of South Alabama. He has done hematopathology fellowship training from Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, Texas, and oncologic surgical pathology fellowship training from Roswell Park Cancer Institute, Buffalo, New York. At present, Dr. Arsalan Ahmed is an associate professor and section head of histopathology at Aachen University Hospital, Karachi. He is an American board certified in anatomic and hematopathology, and he has special interest in hematolymphoid neoplasms. Uh, the topic of his talk would be an update on high-grade B-cell lymphomas. Thank you, Dr. Salan, for taking out the time for to give us um, this presentation. You can start the presentation now. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Uh, my name is Arsan Ahmed. I'm an associate professor and section head in Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at Aachen University. And my talk will be an update on high-grade B-cell lymphomas. Uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma makes the major chunk of aggressive B-cell lymphomas about 30 to 40 percent. Uh, followed by Burkitt lymphoma, B lymphoblastic lymphoma slash leukemia, and double head lymphoma, double head lymphomas, and matrix cell lymphoma, blaster, and pleomorphic variants. But as you can see, with the few large B cell making 30 to 40 percent, that's a big chunk. So, um, more than I'm in most of my talk will be uh, uh, about the few large B cell lymphomas. So, the few large B cell lymphoma can be de novo or it can be transformation from a BCLL. Uh, external marginal zone B cell lymphoma can arise from follicular lymphomas and nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. 
So uh, diffuse large D-cell lymphomas can be, you know, morphologically, they can look like centroblasts uh, where they have per peripherally placed nucleoli and they look like popcorn shape, or they can have this beautiful immunoblast-like features where they have this central looking prominent uh, eosinophilic nucleoli. And they could also look like anaplastic where they are very pleomorphic, about three to five times the size of normal lymphocytes. And, you know, with prominent nuclear, multiple prominent nuclei. They're very ugly looking. So immunoblastic, it can be centroblastic, anaplastic. And this is the basic picture, although they can be C20 negative, but basic picture looks like this. They are C20 positive, C3 negative, and in diffuse sheets. So uh, just to uh, show you the 2016 update, so I'm going to, since this is a very long topic, 20 minutes won't do justice. So we're just going to work on some of the important things about, you know, the updates of, uh, according to WHO classification. So I'll be talking about the diffuse large B cell lymphoma, GC versus non-GC and double expressor. Uh, and then uh, obviously we'll be ta talking about ALK positive large B cell lymphoma, plasmablastic lymphomas, and also borderline cases like high grade B cell lymphoma with MYC and BCL2 and or BCL2 translocations. So uh, WHO, uh, uh, compare, compared to the 2008 WHO classification, 2016, I'll just go over quickly. Diffuse large B cell lymphoma, NOS in 2008. Now you cannot just write NOS, you have to specify whether it's general center type or non GC type, and whether it's double expressor, tri triple expressor or not. Then primary cutaneous diffuse large B cell lymphoma, leg type also have MYD88 L265 mutations in 50% of the cases. EBV positive diffuse large B cell of the elderly in 2008 is now has been changed to EBV positive diffuse large B cell lymphoma NOS and EBV positive mucocutaneous ulcers. Plasmablastic lymphomas have uh, in 2016 will be shown to have a MIC rearrangement in 50% of the cases. Burkitt's lymphoma can be 814, but at the same time, you have Burkitt's lymphoma with LMNQ aberration. And finally, B cell lymphoma unclassifiable with features intermediate between diffuse large B cell lymphoma and Burkitt's lymphoma has been broken down into high grade B cell lymphoma with MYC and BCL2 and or BCL6 rearrangement. And secondly, high grade B cell lymphoma NOS. So we're going to quickly touch to all of them, you know, and I'm going to use it uh, case wise. So, how do I approach it? First thing, are the cells pleomorphic or monomorphic? Okay, so if it's pleomorphic, it's easy. You know, diffuse large B cell lymphomas are pleomorphic. If they are monomorphic, then I have to think about, is it blastoid looking? Can it be mantle cell lymphoma? Could it be ALL itself? Okay, so if it's, you know, uh, pleomorphic or monomorphic, whatever, you know, if the next thing will be, is it CD5 and cyclin D1 positive or negative? Okay, if they are positive, they can go into a mantle cell lymphoma, blastoid or pleomorphic variant. Does KI67 index is less than 90%? If it's more than 90%, it automatically goes into Burkitt's lymphoma. If it's less than 90%, then I start thinking about diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And we have to check for EBV. EBV, if it's EBV positive, everything is off. It becomes EBV positive diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So quickly going by, before I go into CD10, uh, once again, it has to be pleomorphic or monomorphic. Okay, in monomorphic, I have to check CD5, cyclin D1. If CD5 and cyclin D1 are positive, then I'll have to think of mantle cell lymphoma, blastoid, or mantle or a pleomorphic variant. Oh, if, if the KI67 is more than 90%, I have to think of Burkitt's. If it's EBV positive, I have to think of EBV positive diffuse large cell lymphoma. If, all of, if the, uh, all of them are negative or EBV is negative, CD5 is negative, and KI67 is less than 90%, the next thing is I want to call a diffuse large B cell lymphoma. The next step would be, is it CD10 positive? If it's CD10 negative, if it's CD10 positive, then I'll call it diffuse large B cell lymphoma, general center type. If it's CD10 negative, then I'll call it, and uh, I'll have to order BCL6 and MUM1. And I'm gonna discuss this in the Hans algorithm. Once I've got the GC, non-GC done, then the next would be BCL2 and MYC uh, by ISC. And this is to de determine whether it's double expressor, and or triple expressor, DLBCL. And finally, if I have, if MIC comes out positive, the next thing I have to order will be FISH. And you know, so this is the basic algorithm I follow. 
And now I'll go, to, I'll just show you how I do it when I have a case in front of me. So I've put in several cases. Let's see how they go about it. So my first case was a 60 year old with the lump in axilla. The cells look pretty pleomorphic looking. Uh, this is a normal lymphocyte. These are pretty large, about two and a half times larger than the size of a normal lymphocyte. You can see some mitosis also. Same, a closer look, looking pleomorphic, and at the same time, uh, you know, have prominent nuclei and mitosis here and there. You can see them. So this looks like a, uh, uh, it looks like a large B cell lymphoma. Looks pleomorphic. So I'm going to follow the same step. We did a CD5 and cyclin D1. They came out to be negative. So obviously I removed the blastoid and mantle cell lymphoma, uh, uh, pleomorphic variant of mantle cell lymphoma out of the way. The next thing was, is it EBV? So it was EBV negative. So I moved the EBV also out of the way. So, you know, so I was pleomorphic, large B cell lymphoma, mantle cell gone, EBV positive diffuse large B cell lymphoma gone. So I'll settle down and I'll think about, okay, now let me work with diffuse large B cell. So this, this was CD20 positive, CD3 negative, and KI67 was high, but about 7 to 80, 80 to 90, but not more than 90%. So right now I'm thinking of pleomorphic large B cell, C20 positive, you know, KI67 about 70 to 80%. So I'm thinking diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So now, according to 2016 WHO classification, what do I do next? I have to determine is it going to be GC or non GC? So, two, three things. Is it CD10 positive? If it's CD10 positive, it automatically becomes GCB, which is germinal center type. If it's CD10 negative, then I'll have to order BCL6 and MUM1. And uh, if, uh, for everybody, ABC is activated B cell type, which is non GC also. And GCB is germinal center type. Okay, so let's first order CD10. So my CD10 was negative. Okay, my CD10 negative, my BCL6 came out positive, and MUM1 came out positive. So I'm going to tell you the threshold. All these have, in order to call them positive, they have to be more than 30% be cut off. That's according to WHO. So our diffuse, our diffuse large B cell lymphoma case was CD10 negative, BCL6 was positive, and MUM1 was positive. So let's go back to Hans algorithm and see what happens. So since it was CD10 negative, we were ordered BCL6 and MUM1. So in our case, it was BCL6 positive, MUM1 was positive. So it automatically be becomes diffuse large B cell lymphoma, ABC type or non-GC type. If it would have been BCL6 negative, I would have called it non-germinal center type. If it was BCL6 positive, MUM1 negative, I would have called it germinal center type. So there are different configurations, but important thing is, Diffuse large B cell and follow the Hans algorithm. That is the most important thing. So our case was called diffuse large B cell lymphoma non-GC type. So here again, we don't stop. What do you do next? You know, so we have to order. Remember, we have to uh, see whether they have deb deb double expressors or do we have to do cyanogenetic genetic study of them or not. So we have to order MYC protein and BCL2. MYC protein cutoff is 40%. And for BCL2, more than 50%. So the important the reason is if we end up calling it diffuse large B cell double expressor, they have a worse outcome than diffuse large B cell NOS, but not as aggressive as double hit or triple hit. So it's just a prognostic indicator and not a separate uh, category. So it will always remain as a diffuse large B cell lymphoma NOS. So our case was CMIC positive, more than 40% and BCL2 was more than 50%. So going back thinking, this is diffuse large B cell lymphoma, non-germinal center type, and it has got BCL2 positive, BCL6 positive, and CMIC positive. This is like a double, triple expressor. So, so what should I call it now? Uh, before I call it diffuse large B cell lymphoma, all in the, we have to do a FISH study, because cytogenetic study, because if there is rearrangement, then you cannot call it diffuse large B cell. Then you will have to call it high grade B cell lymphoma with this, this, this CMIC rearrangement slash BCL2 slash BCL6 rearrangement. So for a clinician, while the cytogenetic studies go on, what we do is we call it high grade B cell lymphoma and our differentials include diffuse large, like in this case, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, NOS, non-GC type and double expressor. And actually I should have called it a triple expressor. 
and high-grade B-cell lymphoma with CMIX slash BCL2 slash BCL6 rearrangement and order, you know, wait for cytogenetic studies. If cytogenetic studies shows rearrangement, they will be called high-grade B-cell lymphoma with CMIX slash BCL2 slash BCL6 rearrangement. If cytogenetic studies come out negative, then this will be called diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, non-GC type, double express. Okay, so this is my first case. And this is the very important because, you know, they may the major bulk in our institution and worldwide. So it is very important, imperative to understand these things. So what are the indications? When do you order make BCL2, BCL6? So uh, according to some of the papers, whenever you have a GC phenotype and or high grade morphology and cases with more than 40% make positive cells. I've already spoken about workup. So whenever we have immunophenotyping where we have MIC positive and BCL2 and BCL6 positive by immunophenotyping, before we call it uh, diffuse large B cell, we have to do a MIC study. First study. If MIC come out negative, you go back, call it diffuse large B cell lymphoma, whatever. If they come out positive, then you have to go with high grade B cell lymphoma with CMIC slash whatever, BCL2 slash BCL6 rearrangement. Okay. So, so what is high grade? Since we have already spoken about diffuse large B cell, suppose a rearrangement study comes up and we call it high grade B cell lymphoma with CMIC and BCL2 and or BCL6 rearrangement. Why do we call it? So previously known as B cell lymphoma, unclassifiable with features intermediate between DLBCL and BL. They have they are B cell lymphomas with MIC slash AQ24 rearrangement in combination with translocation involving another gene like BCL2 and BCL6. Therefore, they are also known as double hit or triple hit lymphomas. And, um, and uh, the uh, MIC slash BCL2 are the most common and they account for five to 15% of all DL BCL NOSs. And morphologically, they are, look, look pretty, they are very high grade. They look like they can look like Burkett's lymphoma also. And, and look at the starry sky, like look, look at the number of mitosis. So very aggressive looking. This is, uh, you know, we took it from Blood you know, Journal 2016, which came up with the WHO classification. And uh, very easy, I won't go into details. Whenever I'm calling something diffuse large B cell lymphoma, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, NOS, or Burkitt's lymphoma, or blastoid looking, if it turns out to have a MIC rearrangement along with translocation of BCL2 and BCL6, it becomes very easy. You just go ahead and call it high grade B cell lymphoma with uh, MIC uh, and BCL2. And you know, if there is BCL and or BCL6 rearrangement, that's, that's your answer. So that is the power of having cytogenetic study. And that is the need of the day. You have to do cytogenetic studies to call it this. So if, uh, if suppose the high grade B cell lymphoma was, uh, MIC was rearrangement was negative, then you can think about calling it diffuse large B cell lymphoma NOS. If 814 translocation, you can call it Burkitt's lymphoma. If there is blastoid variant and blastoid variant TT is coming up positive, then you call it LBL, B cell lymphoma, lymphoblastic lymphoma. Or if CD5 positive, cyclin D1 comes positive in a blastoid, I will call it a, a, a mantle cell lymphoma, blastoid variant. But the important thing is getting, you should not have rearrangement of MIC and or BCL2 and BCL, translocation of BCL2 and BCL6 rearrangement. So this is very important now. Okay. So <clears throat> high-grade B-cell lymphoma, there is another term, high-grade B-cell lymphoma NOS. This is important because in this, nothing comes out. Just CD20 positive. They look like blastoid. No rearrangement. Sterility is negative. CD5 cyclin D1 negative. And they are, they are looking like blastoid. So we call them hybrid B cell lymphoma NOS. So features like this and this very much fall into the uh, category of hybrid B cell lymphoma NOS. Second case. So I finished DLBCL and hybrid B cell lymphomas with MIC rearrangement and translocation of BCL to BCL6, uh, you know, translocation. So please keep them up. Then they, they will always make the major bulk of large aggressive hybrid B cell lymphomas. My second case is a 55-year-old male with two-month history of swelling on left side of neck and left axilla. So this was appeared in diffuse sheets, diffuse sheets. They look intermediate in size. They are not very high. They were, they were very blue looking, 
they, they were, had inconspicuous nuclei, were pretty fairly uh, uniform. And um, so they were C20 positive and the KSK index was very high. So again, they were, they were looking monomorphic. So the first thing I did was we went ahead and did CD5 and cyclin D1 positive, very positive. So a very easy case. You know, if I was just following my simple table, you know, makes it very easy, especially when the patient's over the age of 45. I, I never try, I try to always do CD5, cyclin D1 positive on this. And this was called Bantle cell lymphoma blastoid variant. So again, if you just follow that simple algorithm I showed you, uh, help you to, you know, sidetrack for many other diagnoses. So case three is a 12 year old with bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy. These were very pleomorphic looking, very ugly looking, very anaplastic. They were in sheets as well as in scattered and in clusters. And uh, they came out to be 79 positive, Pax5 positive, EBV positive, CD30 positive. So <clears throat> since they could, the differential was very large, they could have been called classical Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, lymphocyte depleted. They could have been uh, diffused large B cell lymphoma. Again, and CD5, I just followed my others as a 12 year old, CD5 was negative in this. Important thing was this was LCA positive, 79A positive, Pax5. As a result, Hodgkin was off. This could, have, this could easily have been a classical Hodgkin lymphoma lymphocyte depletion. And it could have been diffused large B cells. But since, remember, C20, but if you have EBV positive, then everything is off. It has to be called EV positive diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And EV positive diffuse large B cell lymphomas are often CD30 positive and CD15 positive. So this was EV positive diffuse large B cell lymphoma, uh, 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 NOS. H cutoff has been dropped and it's a worse prognosis than EBV negative tumors. Other, another entity which comes in is the EV positive microcutaneous ulcers within this, where there's a lot of ulceration underneath. You see cells in scattered clusters, they can be sheets and aggregates. And they are CD30 positive. And as you can see, these are EBER positive. So EV positive mucocutaneous ulcer is a newly recognized clinical pathological entity, occurs in patients with age-related uh, or iatrogenic immunosuppression. And they can, immunohistochemical features are very similar to Hodgkin's-like disease. Important thing, very important, typically indolent course with spontaneous regression responding to reduction of immunosuppressive therapy. So you see, this is very important to remember that it has a very indolent course with spontaneous regression. So you have, it'll major blunder calling it Hodgkin's like disease or even um, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So you have to keep that in mind. And since they arise, uh, the, uh, they, they, they have been thought to have a PDL1 pathway, which plays a role in the immune escape of tumor cells and associated with the prognosis and prediction of treatment. So again, I've already mentioned this according to this paper, don't over-diagnose these as the disease appears to be indolent uh, overall and may spontaneously regress. And while some are methotrexate associated, often immunosuppression is age-related. Then there's primary diffuse like we said, leg type. Occurs mostly in elderly females who usually present with rapidly growing tumors in one or both legs. And these are very aggressive tumors requiring very aggressive treatment. And multiple lesions require adverse prognostic, is a adverse prognostic indicators. So you see multiple pullless lesions on the leg. And the more the lesions, the more the adverse the prognosis. And again, the epidermis is uninvolved. It is involving the deep dermis and subcutaneous issues. And they are C20 positive, MUM1 positive. So these diffuse large like B cell lymphoma leg type are usually. Uh, BCL6 positive, BCL2 positive, and MUM1 are positive. So they are basically diffuse large B cell lymphomas of non GC type or activated B cell. And they have 40 to 75 percent have MYD88 L265 mutations and reported to be of prognostic significance. And very easy, whenever diffuse large B cell lymphomas, any lymphoma, B cell lymphomas of leg type will always have bad prognosis, they'll always have poor prognosis. One thing to remember, ABN negative cases that look like diffuse large lymph had EBV negative cases that look like diffuse large, uh, large B cell lymphoma had a complete remission after discontinuing methotrexate. 
So patient on methotrexate should, having lesions, should be made sure that they can mimic diffuse large B cells. So try to remove methotrexate before diagnosing it diffuse large B cell lymphomas. Okay. Large B cell lymphoma with IR4 rearrangement. This is another ent new entity which helps to distinguish between pediatric follicular and other diffuse large B cell lymphoma. They usually love to go around the Valdir rings and our cervical lymph nodes and low stage. These cases have a mixture of they are CD20 positive, CD10 positive, BCL6 positive, and MUM1 positive. So they, they grow like they can be follicular growing, they can have follicular pattern, follicular and diffuse pattern, and pure diffuse pattern. So the, the, the most important key point is any lymphoma arising in Valdez ring around the head and neck, having a follicular pattern or follicular and diffuse pattern, and showing uh, co-expression for CD10, BCL6, and MUM1 should be screened for IR4 rearrangement. So that is the most important point. So they can look very pre pre pleomorphic, you know, they, they, you can see they have vesicular nuclei, prominent nucleoli, uh, very mitotically pretty active, and you can see these beautiful large follicles. So they can be follicles and follicular and diffuse. So whenever I have this, and they have, if they are CD10 positive, BCL6 positive, MUM1, I have to screen them for IR4 rearrangement. And this was a case of, you know, large B cell lymphoma with IR4 rearrangement. And as you can see, C10 positive, MUM1 positive, and IR4 rearrangement can be seen in this. So this was a 60 year old man with a lymph adenopathy and suspicious for adenocarcinoma or germ cell tumor. So this was a core biopsy, which looked very aggressive could not make out look like it could have been in aggregates also could look look like an epithelial tumor could also look like a you know a melanoma so this was very aggressive looking when i looked at it lymphoma was on my it was it could have been a carcinoma it was melanoma anything which was you know pretty aggressive looking so the thing which caught my mind was they had its plasma cytoid look had a plasma cytoid look you know had a lot of essentially looking plasma, but very aggressive and very prominent nucleoli. This is a very plus, a very important point for this tumor. Have these beautiful prominent nucleoli. And they were this this case was LCA negative, C3 negative, C20 negative, C30 negative. So this tumor came out to be EMA positive, 138 positive, MUM1 positive. So totally with, with had a very plasma plastic morphology. Um, had a plasma plastic morphology retrospectively, and immunohistochemistry also supported plasma uh, uh, plasma cytoid, you know, uh, origin. Whenever you have such an ugly tumor with prominent nuclei, plasma cytoid looking, although B cell morphology is completely negative, but and uh, MUM1 138 is positive, CD30 is negative and very aggressive. Before you call it plasma plastic lymphoma, you should always do ALK. So differentials include plasma blastic lymphoma, anaplastic plasma cytoma, or ALK positive large B cell lymphoma. ALK was positive in this case. So this was signed out as ALK positive large B cell lymphoma. They are very rare and highly aggressive tumors. And they have no association with immunosuppression. Mostly uh, 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 associated with young patients with male-female ratio of 5 to 1. So I always remember ALK positive large B cell lymphomas so they are actually pan B cell lymphomas negative, CD30 negative. So this is the most important thing also. And we, when you have pan B cell negative, again, I'm repeating myself, 30 negative, but plasma cell mark, uh, lineage is coming in 130 and MUM1. Before you think of plasma plastic, always the ALK. And you will never miss it. The ALK positive large B cell lymphomas. Very highly aggressive. And uh, they, the, since they are C20 negative, they are, insensitive to rituximab, but they are, uh, you know, crezitinib, uh, can, an inhibitor of ALK and tyrosine kinase has shown a, a therapeutic e efficacy in some ALK protein neoplasm. But a big question mark on this. Plasma blastic lymphoma has an increased incidence in HIV, in immunodeficiency, advanced stage. So I always plasma blastic goes with immunosuppression. Very aggressive with death within one year. And this is, you can see this in ALK positive large like B-cell also lymphomas very aggressive death, but no immunosuppression. And they can very much look like ALK positive large B cell lymphoma. Look at them, 
with a plasma blasted morphology and very prominent nucleoli. And here, the plasma blasted lymphomas are 30 positive. They can be 30 positive, and, but they have 138. They are, again, B cell lineage is negative in it. And EBER is 60 to 75% positive. Again, very important point, which helps you differentiate. So other differentials with, when I think of al positive large B cell lymphomas and plasma blastic lymphomas, since they are all CD20 negative, and they can, they, are, they have to be called B cell lymphomas. I have to think of anaplastic plasma cytomas have to come in mind. And uh, primary effusion lymphomas are also, but they, they're also, uh, but they have no tumor masses they, they, uh, without any detectable tumor masses. Nearly all patients are HIV positive and HHLV8 is positive. Okay, so, uh, uh, so I have almost touched on my main important topic was diffuse large B cell lymphoma, how to report it according to 2016 WHO classification. And, you know, the, when diffuse large B cell lymphoma, before calling it, cytogenetics is very important because once, if rearrangement comes in CMIC, and uh, 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 translocation can be seen used automatically. The diagnosis goes towards high grade B cell lymphomas with the, you know, CMIC and translocation of BCL2, BCL6 rearrangement. So keep that in mind and follow the, whenever you follow that uh, algorithm, you can never go wrong. So uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, and if there are any questions, you know, uh, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, Dr. Arsalan, for uh, giving us such a wonderful presentation. And this is definitely going to help us in our um, daily routine practices. Um, the next presentation is from Dr. Imran Nazir. Uh, Dr. Imran Nazir is a diplomat American board in anatomic pathology. He is also diplomat American board in hematopathology. He graduated from Punjab Medical College, Punjab University in 1996 and completed his residency training in anatomical and clinical pathology from Yale affiliated Danbury oh, Hospital Yale affiliated Danbury Hospital uh, CT USA hematopathology fellowship from Albany Medical College Albany USA and surgical pathology fellowship from Yale University New Haven CT USA he joined Shifa International Hospital Islamabad as a consultant pathologist in 2008 and was appointed the Chief of Pathology and Director Lab in 2014. He is also the Section Head of Flow Cytometry Lab and Molecular Pathology Lab. He is an Assistant Professor of Pathology at Shifa College of Medicine and the Lead Pathologist for Hematological Diseases and Urological Diseases. He is going to give a talk on recent updates on T-cell lymphomas. Thank you so much, Dr. Imran, for joining us. Um, you can please start your presentation. Hello, <laughs> I am Dr. Imran Nazir Ahmed. Uh, I work in Chippa Hospital as consultant hematopathologist and histopathologist. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, T cell lymphomas. Uh, my initial half of the talk is going to be about some revisions of the T cell entities that took place in 2017. And then I would like to share a few of the interesting uh, cases which are relevant. Uh, which are relatively more common as far as T cell lymphomas are concerned. So, uh, this classification was revised in early 2017, and the textbook came out probably in uh, 2018. And uh, then, uh, you know, this basically was a revision of the fourth edition of 2008. Uh, some provisional entities of 2008 were uh, promoted to definitive uh, entities, and then few new provisional entities were also uh, added to this classification. Uh, for example, um, so, you know, we're all familiar with that few of the uh, entities like systemic EBV T cell lymphoma of childhood, indolent T cell lymphoproliferative disorders of GI tract, um, entropathy associated lymphomas were merged, uh, then follicular helper T cell lymphomas were also merged, so on and so forth. So I have few quick slides about all the major changes that were done in uh, 2017. Uh, so I will uh, briefly go over with them. Uh, there have been significant advances in both nodal and extranodal NK cell lymphomas, uh, basically attributed to the um, state of the art technologies available, especially a gene expression profiling. Uh, that led to new insights into nodal peripheral T cell lymphomas, which is the most common lymphoma, 
and then few recurrent mutations were also identified in angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma. Please note that you know, unlike B cell lymphomas, very few T cell lymphomas have some characteristic uh, gene mutations or other molecular abnormalities. So, um, angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma and follicular T cell lymphoma they are unified in this classification. But these uh, entities, like there are two, uh, two of these lymphomas, they should have a T follicular helper phenotype, which is um, predicted or which is confirmed by the presence of uh, at least two of these following antigens, namely like PD1, uh, which is also known as CD279, uh, CD10, BCL6, CXL13, ICOS, SAP, and CCR5. Then uh, they also have some recurrent genetic abnormalities. Most common ones are PET2, IDH2, and then RHOA and two others. All these mutations, they do take part in the lymphoma genesis and they are also the target of the newly available uh, targeted therapies. Of note, both of these lymphomas, they almost always have increased B cell, EBV positive uh, immunoblasts or blasts. They sometimes can also have Hodgkin Reed Sternberg like cells, which can potentially lead to a mistaken diagnosis of classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Peripheral T cell lymphoma, uh, not otherwise specified, it remains the most common T cell lymphoma. And uh, it's, in other words, it's the DLBCL of the T cell lymphomas. It has uh, extreme cytological and immunophenotypic heterogeneity. And gene expression profiling has shown that there is a global signature which is close to one of the activated T lymphocytes. Uh, we must know that most of the T cell lymphomas, similar or with B cell lymphomas, they recapitulate the maturation process, the normal maturation process of the lymphoid cells. So, you know, they are going to be some thymic uh, immunophenotype. There's some cortical thymic immunophenotype uh, imaging, uh, mirroring in the lymphomas, and sometimes the medullary thymic immunophenotype that is also seen in the lymphoma counterparts. So in this PTCL type, the, at least three uh, major mutations of genetic abnormalities have been identified, which are incorporated in this classification, namely GATA3, TBX21, and few cytotoxic genes. And these subtypes are associated with different clinical behavior and response to therapy. So this is a major advancement that in, even in T cell lymphomas, the genetic mutations, they are predicting the outcome. GATA, for example, GATA3 subtype has inferior prognosis because of high levels of thi 2 cytokines. And then uh, next generation sequencing is also um, elaborating a lot of uh, abnormalities, which are the potential for targeted therapy. Anaplastic large cell lymphoma, ALK negative. It used to be a provisional entity. Now it's a definitive uh, category. It's a, uh, and it's basically by definition should be ALK negative, but it is very genetically close to ALK positive ALC. Uh, DUSP22 and IRF4 rearrangements at chromosome 6P25 shows monomorphic cells lacking cytotoxic granules and they carry superior prognosis. So by predicting this uh, mutation, this abnormality, we can have some uh, prognostication of these lymphomas. There is a small subset of cases with TP63 mutation. And they are, in contrast, more aggressive as compared to the above ones. Then in case of lymphomatoid papillosis, uh, which had type A, type B, and type C, uh, we have three additional subtypes naming type D, which mimics primary cutaneous aggressive epidermotropic CD8 positive type cytotoxic T cell lymphoma. And then we have type E, which characteristically on morphology will show angioinvasion. Then there is a category of lymphomatoid papillosis with chromosome 6P25 alteration. And this is clinically similar to other forms of lymphomatoid papillosis. However, histologically, it can mimic aggressive T cell lymphoma. Another uh, entity, breast implant-associated ALCL, it has been included as a provisional category. Uh, by definition, it should be ALK negative, 
and it's seen in both saline and silicon filled implants, uh, usually seen after about 10 years of breast implant. Most cases show lymphoma cells which are confined to the seroma fluid without invasion of the capsule. These patients are managed conservatively with removal of implant. If the capsule gets involved, there is a risk of lymph node involvement and systemic spread warranting systemic therapy. So this is how um, these breast implant associated anaplastic lymphoma cells would look like really, really bizarre, large cells. You do see some hallmark cells, but they will be negative for ALK while they will be for CD30. Then we have cytotoxic T-cell lymphomas and leukemias. These are a heterogeneous group of diseases with varied clinical behavior and prognosis. Other than ALCL, most are extranodal with involvement of spleen, liver, and bone marrow. And two provisional entities are, have been added to this classification. Number one, indolent T-cell lymphoproliferative disorder with GI tract, and then primary cutaneous acral CD8 positive T-cell lymphoma. The GI tract indolent T-cell lymphoproliferative disorder is derived, as the name suggests, is from CD8, or on rare occasions, it can also be CD4 positive. And is, it has a pretty indolent clinical course. We did have a case about one year ago in our hospital. Then a primary cutaneous active CD8 positive T-cell lymphoma is a localized disease limited to a single site, ear being the most common organ, and it also has very indolent course, doesn't need chemotherapy, it's managed usually conservative. So this is the picture, you know, a skin, it has a shiny nodule, uh, which is positive for, which is facing the, uh, the skin architecture in, in involve, involving the dermis, and it has uh, CD3 positivity. Then few of the JAK stat pathways also have been identified in, in many T cell and NK cell tumors. Uh, for example, STAT3 is seen in large granular lymphocytic leukemias of both T cell and NK cell types. Then STAT5B and STAT3, they are seen in hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma of gamma delta origin, as well as in primary cutaneous T cell lymphomas. STAT5B is seen in about 36% of the type 2 eaters, which is now known as beetle. Uh, I'll have uh, I have a slide next slide on that. So it used to be type one and type two etal entropathy associated T cell lymphoma. Now uh, it's type one is simply called EATL etal, which is closely linked to celiac disease, usually seen in the northern European uh, patients. And this is mostly expressing alpha beta receptors, but there is a variant which will have gamma delta receptors. The type 2 is now known as monomorphic epitheliotropic intestinal T cell lymphoma, or METL, in other words. Uh, it has no association with celiac. It's mostly seen in Asians and Hispanics. We did have a case of METL about a couple of months ago. Uh, then these uh, METL, these patients will have gains of chromosome 8, Q24, involving the semic region. Uh, these cases are mostly CD8 positive, CD2. 6 positive and MATL positive as well. Most of these cases are derived from gamma delta, uh, but um, exceptions are always there. So type 1 would be alpha beta, and type 2, which is now metal, is usually gamma delta. Uh, just a picture to depict the monomorphic entropathy associated T cell lymphoproliferative. Uh, so we have a very monomorphic, uh, same similar size cells, which are involving the mucosa, crypt, uh, surface mucosa. So these are pretty aggressive lymphomas, by the way. Then uh, we have this entity CD4 positive small slash medium T cell lymphoproliferative. The name has been changed to primary cutaneous CD4 positive small medium T cell lymphoproliferative disorder. Because of its indolent behavior, the lymphoma name has been taken away and it's been called disorder. And uh, this uh, may represent a limited clonal response to some unknown stimulus not fulfilling the criteria of malignancy. That's how it would look like complete replacement of the dermis by a small monomorphic bland looking uh, T cells. Then we have uh, EBV positive T cell and NK cell lymphomas. Uh, NK cell EBV positive is nasal type is still the most common type. 
but there are two less common entities which have been added to this classification. Number one is chronic active EBV infection, and number two is systemic EBV positive T cell lymphoma of childhood. Both are more common in Asians. Systemic EBV positive T cell lymphoma is no longer referred to as LPD due to its again, uh, you know, due to its permanent clinical course and also association with HLH. So it it's now called lymphoma rather than this disorder. Then node-based EBV positive PTCL are uncommon and they are referred as peripheral T cell lymphomas, not otherwise specified. So that was just like you know a brief overview of the, the changes that we saw in the latest classification. Now I would like to share some of the uh, cases of T cell lymphomas. Um, I believe uh, T cell lymphomas are hard to diagnose. They're pretty challenging because they lack as uh, we discussed initially, they lack, most of the lymphomas lack uh, characteristic morphological patterns. Most of the lymphomas, they lack characteristic molecular abnormalities with few exceptions. So I would like to go over those cases which at least do present some characteristic morphological appearances and they are associated with some sort of uh, typical immunophenotype or a characteristic molecular abnormality. So just to go uh, over the epidemiology, PTCL is the most common, followed by angioimmunoblastic, followed by natural killer T cell lymphoma, and then uh, comes anaplastic, ALK positive, and ALK negative lymphomas. But please do note that T cell lymphomas are relatively uncommon as compared to T cell lymphomas. I would, I think they represent like about 10 or 15% uh, according to different studies as compared to 80 to 85% all of the lymphomas are B cell lymphomas. And since uh, these are tough diagnostically, so we need to incorporate everything into the picture. Uh, clinical pic examination, we do need to have, we need, need to focus on the morphology, uh, we need to focus on the flow cytometry or immunohistochemistry and fish if it's available. So uh, having said that, I will, my first case is of 45 years old female, who had a mass palpable in axillary region without any mass in the breast, and there was some generalized lymphopathy. On low power examination, uh, there is like diffuse effacement of the nodal architecture. We do not see any normal histological landmarks on high power examination. Uh, most of the cells are uh, medium sized, I would say, uh, but there are some interspersed larger cells which are higher, which will be shown in the next picture but over here uh, what we do not see is like you know not many vessels no high endothelial venule proliferations and on high power examination most of the cells are like similar size medium size but there are some like you know larger cells as well uh, so uh, this cell kind of looks like hallmark cell uh, which is the characteristic cell of anaplastic lymphoma so you know, what I would uh, suggest is that whenever we're dealing with the T cell lymphoma, in our head, we should rule out the ones which have characteristic appearances like anaplastic lymphoma and immunoblastic T cell lymphoma, and then uh, go from there. Or on rare occasion, we should also notice if there is angio invasion or fibrinoid type necrosis, so that NK lymphoma is also kept in mind. But in this case, I, I, I honestly didn't see any of those characteristic features, except like, you know, these few larger cells, which have these hallmark type of appearances. And immunohistochemistry, it's not going to be much surprise uh, in my today's talk, since you know, we're dealing with T cell lymphomas. So uh, CD20 is negative. However, CD3 is strongly and crisply positive. CD4 is positive much stronger as compared to CD8. Actually, CD8 is essentially negative. It's probably picking up few of the uh, histiocytic cells in the background. Uh, CD21, which is a very, very helpful marker um, after morphology for diagnosing angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma. Um, I, I have a case uh, coming up of angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma as well. Then CD5, loss of CD5 in a T cell lymphoma is an evidence of aberrancy, evidence of malignancy. So it's a CD5 with a pan T marker, which is lost in this case. So CD30, anaplastic large cell lymphomas can have different types of morphological appearances, but in our case, CD30 is negative, which should be positive in ALCLs. 
So this would be diagnosed as after excluding all those definitive entities as peripheral T cell lymphoma, not otherwise specific, not, not otherwise specified. So it's a heterogeneous category of nodal and extranodal mature T cell lymphomas, which don't correspond to any of the specifically defined WHO categories. Uh, lymphomas of T follicular helper genotype are excluded, and they almost always a disease of elderly. They have heterogeneous morphological picture with few variants, lymphoepithelial lymphoma, for example, also known as Lennart's lymphoma and immunostochemistry, they're more uh, CD4 positive as compared to CD8, and then it should be, uh, you know, the other loss of panty markers can also be seen. Uh, they almost always have advanced stage presentation and T cell receptor genes are most of the time uh, deranged. So which is an evidence that we are dealing with a lymphoma and they have highly aggressive clinical course uh, and failure to uh, treatments. Next case is 60 years old male with a history of B symptoms for last one month, generalized lymph lymphopathy. So this clinical history is suggesting that it's a very short duration history uh, and should be, you know, you might be dealing with an aggressive lymphoma, which on low power examination is totally effacing the architecture. We don't see any sinuses. Uh, there's obliteration of uh, all the normal landmarks on higher power examination. The first thing that we notice is that there are a lot of uh, vascular proliferation, which known as high endothelial linear proliferation. And then the um, there is a polymorphous in atopic infiltrate, and that polymorphous infiltrate is composed predominantly of medium to large cells, which have a sort of clear cytoplasm. They have vesicular chromatin, the prominence of nuclei, and the background is uh, showing mature lymphocytes, few plasma cells, and uh, some neutrophils as well, which are probably not seen in this picture. Immunostochemistry wise, this infiltrate was CD3 positive, CD20 positive, CD20. Scattered positive, I should say. They're like, you know, you can see there are some larger cells which are positive over here, and the dark staining cells are probably the reactive B cells in the background. And that's the stain which I was talking about, C21, <clears throat> which is a follicular dendritic cell marker. So this is highlighting markedly destructed follicular dendritic meshwork. I think, in my, uh, you know, limited experience, uh, this is a diagnostic or prognostic marker, uh, di diagnostic marker of angioblastic T-cell lymphoma. Uh, as compared to follicular lymphoma, they will have back-to-back -back follicles, they, but they will have, they still would have round contours, something like that. Uh, margins or lymphomas will have expanded uh, meshwork because of colonization by margin cells, but they still will have uh, well-defined borders. Unlike over here, this is like, you know, really all over the place. On high power examination, you can see this real extensive destruction of this FTC network. And then we uh, definitely would confirm with uh, specific follicular helper markers. And in our case, it was strongly positive for PD1. Uh, CD10 was also positive. BCL6 was also positive. So this was diagnosed as angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma, which is a neoplasm of follicular helper cells. Most of the patients are elderly. Morphology we discussed already and immunostochemistry wise they most of the time since they are helper origin they are cd4 positive and efh markers which are where we have multiple like six to eight markers available where at least two of these should be positive cd30 can be positive in uh, some of the b immunoblasts and then uh, one point to be uh, remembered is that almost all of these lymphomas will have ebv positive b cells which can simultaneously uh, like as, as a composite phenomena progress to EBV positive large B cell lymphoma, or um, we can have EBV positive large B cell lymphoma at the relapse of angioblastic T cell lymphomas. So these are really, really uh, aggressive lymphomas. Now I would come to uh, my uh, third case. This is a nine year old boy with history of fever, cough, backache for three weeks multiple lesions all over the body, especially right lower chest and abdominal wall, low power examination is diffuse effacement with this starry sky appearance. And whenever we think starry sky, that's like, you know, we're dealing with a very aggressive lymphoma. Uh, you can see this is because of these tangible body macrophages. A lot of these abnormal looking large cells which have prominent nucleoli, sort of vesicular chromatin, many mitosis, apoptosis, so in this picture, 
we the differentialists of course we should first of all think burkitt although morphology is not very characteristic burkitt has like medium sized sort of monomorphic cells we had large cells that can also be seen in lymphoblastic lymphoma used rg cell lymphoma in some aggressive cell lymphoma so immunistic chemistry was done pan t marker is negative t is to the 20 is negative we did another the cd10 for to you know reconfirm burkitt so it was again negative um then we thought is it a sarcoma sometimes they can also present very aggressively a uh, myeloid sarcoma so that's negative pan keratin was negative tdt which is uh, you know lymphoblastic it rules out lymphoblastic however when we did cd30 it was very nicely uh, positive in almost all the large cells the few of the negative ones are most likely the histiocytes with, with those a cellular debris in them then we have uh, we you know confirmed it by alk and alk is nicely nuclear nucleolar and cytoplasmic positivity so we do need to notice what is the pattern of the alk so it was called as alk positive alcl uh, i have few words about alcl but after this case so this was uh, another 26 uh, relatively young patient with sos abscess diffuse effacement by large cells a lot of apoptosis but over here we had a lot of cells which had plasma cytoid appearance i should say or maybe eosinophilic uh, cytoplasm some hallmark type cells or maybe rhabdomyoblast sort of appearance in some areas mitotically very active uh, so we did think about since relatively young patient about rhabdomyosarcoma could this be a plasma blastic tumor or a large b cell lymphoma or an aggressive b cell lymphoma so desmin was negative Uh, LCA was heterogeneously positive in most of these. Uh, then CD3 was also focally only focally positive. CD20 was negative in this in this case. Pax5 was negative. Uh, CD30 is you can see almost positive in almost every cell and very nice membrane and few areas are showing Golgi staining pattern. But ALK was negative in this case. however ema ema is was positive and it was positive just like cd30 so this was diagnosed as alcl alk negative so these these are the like you know the lymphomas which have characteristic appearances as well as molecular uh, findings so that's why i picked these two cases to share so though most of these patients are uh, nodal diseases but they are very commonly have extra nodal involvement as well patients are relatively young and they have systemic symptoms they are very aggressive but they have very good response to chemotherapy so diagnosing correctly is very very important so these are the extra nodal sites which can be seen in anaplastic large cell lymphomas immunohistochemistry chemistry i would skip since uh, you know but, but just one point that by definition they should be positive for by uh, uh, for cd30 and uh, differential of alcl we would uh, definitely want to rule out hodgkin lymphoma since it's cd30 positive or other t cell lymphomas uh, and or other large aggressive b cell lymphomas and this panel 30 15 lca3 and alk these are the ones that i use but if you have tia ema and clustrin they are also very very helpful in differentiating these lymphomas the translocation uh, most important is the anaplastic lymphoma kinase gene which is present on chromosome Two and it most of the time is its partner is NPM on which is located in chromosome five. So translocation between chromosome two five is the most common one, and the staining pattern would be cytoplasmic, nuclear, and nucleolar. So as in our case, so we can easily say that this was a translocation two five because this staining pattern is kind of surrogate marker for the a molecular. Then it can also combine with chromosome one, chromosome three, or just inversion of chromosome. Uh, alk positive lymphomas they do much better than alk negative lymphomas uh, and alk negative lymphomas still are doing better than rest of the these lymphomas so just to make one point uh, that these lymphomas they do relatively better uh, i would skip this slide for the time sake and i would go to the uh, spectrum of the alcl we can have uh, you know of course the hallmark cells which are the kidney shaped cells or the cells with eccentric uh, eosinophilic um, cytoplasm and eccentric nucleus they should be there at least in minority uh, they can have sinusoidal infiltration which can closely mimic carcinoma and then we can also have perivascular uh, rosetting 
uh, cellular, they can be hypercellular or hypocellular. Uh, but the pitfall in diagnosis is that CD30 is not specific for ALCL. And I just that's why I showed that tables and other lymphomas, Hodgkin and B and other T cell lymphomas can also be CD30 positive. But one take home point is that strong, diffuse, crisp CD30 positive is only seen in ALCL. Uh, this is my last case, then I will uh, finish over here. Uh, this was a case of 39 years old with cervical and axillary lymph adenopathy. Uh, patient had increased LDH and V symptoms for the last three weeks. Uh, this is, the, you know, you can see different large nodules effaced by scattered larger cells. Some of them look like reed Stenberg cells, mummified cells, background full of mixed inflammatory cells. Uh, you can see uh, RS-like cells, but over here, this is most like close to hallmark type cells, but abundance of inflammatory background. Lymphoma was positive for CD3, negative for 20, uh, sorry, uh, lymphoma was negative for CD3, negative for 20, negative for Pax5, LCA was focally positive, 30 was positive in a lot of cells and on higher power, you can see very nice, crisp Golgi type of pattern. And then at this stage, we applied ALK and ALK came out very nicely positive in almost all of the cells. So you, you can again see abundance of these ALK positive cells. So this was a Hodgkin-like pattern of TLCL, which is a relatively uncommon pattern, but it, uh, WHO does mention about that. So microscopically, it resembles nodular sclerosis type of Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, it has no clinical significance, but it can be a diagnostic challenge leading to potential mistakes. So other, uh, you know, common patterns are more, uh, you know, the conventional one, the small cell pattern, they are more common than this Hodgkin-like pattern. So I would finish over here. Um, and uh, I hope uh, you like this. Uh, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Imran, for such a nice presentation. T lymphomas are a, a major source of diagnostic difficulty in our clinical practice. Thank you for such a nice presentation. We have a few questions. If um, and I'll start with Dr. Um, Shahid Parvez. If he can unmute his himself. Um, Dr. Shahid, can you hear me? No, I can hear you. Oh, thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> there are a few questions, sir. Um, uh, the first question is, how do you approach small cell lymphoma on a small core biopsy? Uh, especially since in, in a core biopsy, um, uh, we cannot see the architecture. So what do you do when you um, see these small size lymphoma cells in a core biopsy? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, obviously challenging. And uh, to make a definitive diagnosis in uh, uh, many cases will be difficult. And uh, many of such core biopsies uh, eventually may be reported as uh, features are suggestive of small B cell lymphoproliferative disorder, you know, something like that. Uh, because, uh, you know, for sake of time, I didn't discuss some other small uh, B cell entities, say marginal ma marginal zone lymphomas. You know, they are very uh, challenging, and uh, in contrast to other some other small B cell lymphomas like uh, SLL and mental cell lymphoma, uh, the immunophenotype is uh, really tricky. I mean, there are not very good markers to diagnose uh, uh, marginal zone lymphomas, whether nodal or extranodal. So yes, obviously. Uh, uh, however, if there is predominant uh, population of say, uh, you know, a monomorphic population, you know, monomorphism in a small B cell lymphomas uh, is a clue and a predominant phenotype, you know, if uh, the all the cells are B positive, you know, or T positive for that matter, you know, that helps. Uh, however, as I said, you know, to make a definitive diagnosis, 
it's possible in some cases if uh, we are lucky but in most cases probably it may go as a small uh, cell a small b cell lymphoproliferative disorder and uh, um, you know further workup uh, you know which may require excision of the you know if there is lymphadenopathy of the entire lymph node or sometimes even uh, flow cytometry or bone refine and those things may help to come to a conclusive diagnosis yeah Take. So the second question is, um, you mentioned in your uh, presentation the right background of Hodgkin lymphoma. The, okay, I right. <laughs> especially, especially when you said that okay. there, there was an admixed uh, component of SLL, um, what would be the right background in that case? When you see, in, in that case which I showed you, these uh, Hodgkin type cells were present. They were popping up here and there uh, amidst a typical case of uh, SLL or CLL, right? And there was no inflammatory background, right? So these uh, uh, larger cells, you know, the Hodgkin-like cells may be seen, as I said, you know, uh, in a variety of conditions. Even, you know, if you... Uh, look a normal lymph node under the microscopes. Some cells, you know, may uh, immunoblast may look like Hodgkin cells. Histiocytes may look like Hodgkin cells, right? So if we are not careful about the uh, classic inflammatory background, then, you know, probably we will diagnose, uh, you know, incorrectly many more Hodgkin's lymphomas. And this is particularly very pertinent, you know, when we are looking the bone marrow refined for a staging purpose in a diagnosed case of Hodgkin's lymphoma. That first at low, lower magnification, we must find an area which show effacement, you know, a kind of inflammatory background, which mainly include uh, plasma cells, maybe some eosinophils, right, fibrous tissue, you know, fibrosis, some histocytic reaction, you know, I mean, that's very common, histocytic reaction, uh, or, 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 or some vague granulometrous reaction. And amidst this, if you see these large cells, and they show the correct uh, immunophenotype, then obviously that is consistent with it. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, my next question is to Dr. Salan. Um, if I uh, understood correctly, sir, um, what what I understood is if even if, if it's the background of the lymphoma cells are monomorphic, irrespective of the cell size, uh, you're going to keep Burkitt lymphoma in the differential diagnosis along with the large cell lymphoma. And when do you stop at Burkitt lymphoma and when do you go ahead with um, BCL2, BCL6 or MIC um, immunohistochemistry? Oh, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> I hope you are well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> so, Maybe sometimes when you get up, you know, when those uh, mucus and all that, you know, when make yeah. you make others worried, you know. Uh, uh, today is a grocery day. So, but. <laughs> So uh, the thing is, monomorph when you think of monomorphic, um, I, I, if I remove, uh, if I keep pediatric and adult with me, three, four things come to mind. You know, um, if I have pediatric plus adult, I'll always think of ALL in mind. I'll always think of uh, Burkitt's lymphoma and I'll always uh, think of uh, blastoid variant, mantle cell. So these are some of the things which are always monomorphic. But when I'm going towards adult, so two things really come in, Burkitt's and uh, ALL will always be in my mind as for monomorphic. And uh, if you have monomorphic, you are CD10 positive, CD20 positive, and KI67 is over 90%. I will, I will always have to keep Burkitt's in mind. You always have to. And then obviously, the, once you have CD20 positive, they're looking monomorphic. KI67 is 
you know, 90% to 100%. The next thing is check CD10 and BCL2. If CD10 is positive and BCL2 negative, you know, the first thing is high grade B cell lymphoma. I'll just jump on to, you know, favorite Burkitt's lymphoma and then 814. You know, past many years, we've been calling this favor consistent, but actually this is not right. You know, uh, the, the right thing is always now either to call it high grade B cell lymphoma to help out people. You can call it suggest and favor, but the final say will always be 814 translocation. So we've been, you know, trying to help out clinician by going ahead, but the, technically we should always depend on 814. So, you know, this is how I, you know, move out. Okay, thank you, sir. Dr. Nasheen would like to ask a few more questions. Sorry, Dr. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Shai, Dr. Imran, Dr. Arsalan. Thank you so much for such a wonderful session. Okay, so uh, my question is that high grade lymphomas, they are mature B cell lymphomas which lack TDT expression, right? Uh, but recently, high grade lymphomas with TDT expression has emerged as a diagnostic and classification dilemma. So, double hit lymphomas or N triple hit lymphomas that can present with features which are suggestive of immaturity, including TDT expression. So, do you have any experience with that and how do you deal with it? Since we deal a lot of pediatric lymphomas, so sometimes we get stuck on a core needle biopsy that express TDT. So, it's difficult for us to classify them and we are unable to fit them into a lymphoblastic category. So, are they, uh, are these lymphomas are going to, you know, be classified still as high grade lymphomas that are primarily mature or is it a new entity which which has primarily immature um, the background or you know it, or is it a t, uh, aberrant TDT expression in these high grade lymphomas how do you approach these lymphomas so you know uh, I'll, I'll keep you simple a few days ago got the same case from peds and the thing was TDT was coming out you know about uh, on flow three to four percent and you know the pediatrician was calling me again and again what what do you want to do and, and it was the patient has a mental caking so I asked her, I said, you know, I cannot make a diagnosis in this call for a biopsy. But the thing was, I don't know what your experience, I'll tell you, I, basically I have, haven't got such a, you know, the, too many of these cases like these before. And WHO doesn't also show these as yet. But to me, on flow, when it has kappa restriction, kappa lambda, TDT won't matter to me. Uh, kappa lambda, it means it's gone, it has become mature. And, or if kappa lambda is not there and I with TDT, if I see CD34, then I go towards ALL. Simple. So I keep two things. If TDT is coming out positive and CD34 is coming out positive, I will think of immaturity. If TDT is positive, CD34 is negative and kappa lambda has restriction, then obviously it has to go towards mature. Sometimes they have, they are making that strange transition, which has never been described, moving from ALL to actually towards Burkitt's or mature. So, uh, cannot explain to you much, but this is how I approach it. And for this case, what happened was, when the mental biopsy came in, I looked at TDT was completely negative, although it was coming out four to five percent on the on flow. There were few cells I called it. I thought uh, as being hematogons, and since it was CD10 positive, B cell two negative, TDT negative, CD34 negative, I called it a Burkitt's. So, but um, it, it can be tricky. But again, I keep two thing markers here. TDT is 34 on one side and kappa lambda. But you know, once you have kappa lambda restriction on flow. You always go with maturity. I remove ALL from the uh, picture then for me. And obviously it's difficult. Now you'll ask me, you know, if I have, it's a biopsy. But if you can, if you are caught in such a dilemma, then you should get a flow or something done on it, on a bone marrow, if it's involved. So that's how I, I do it, actually. And if somebody else has a different brown. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, uh, I would agree with uh, that is a big dilemma, actually. We, are having a we're working up a case uh, as late as yesterday, uh, but uh, you know my two cents because flow is not always available, especially on the biopsies. So uh, I I try to stress a lot on morphology and combination of at least two or three immature markers and CD20 also helps a lot. CD20 mm -hmm. very very rarely is diffusely positive in immature. Uh, lesions like you know lymphoblastic lymphoma but it could have some heterogeneity so cd20 crisp strong positivity uh, combined with the uh, mature chromatin lack of immature chromatin per se or uh, no crushing you know those sort of things and but in the end of course uh, 
If, if, as Imran is saying, if, if the, the best thing would be to I look at CD20 then. I would Achha. look at CD20. I will see it. Taliban make one scenario. If CD20 is negative and Pax5 is positive, I will go with BLL. I'm just saying. But if C20 is diffuse and, you know, the TDT is negative, CD34 is negative, then, you know, like this case, if CD10 is positive, I'll, I'll be moving towards maturity. I mean, I will not, usually I don't give weightage. And, you know, over these years, I've done CD99 on many lymph nodes also. You know, I've seen it coming in so many places that, uh, you know, I don't have confidence in CD99. So, so to me, these are the two. And for T, I usually sometimes, sometimes also use CD1A just when I'm caught. But somehow stay away from CD99. Then maybe this is my, you know, my way and maybe Dr. Shahid or Dr. Imran could give, you know, better ideas. Maybe 99 and actually. The problem is with the... The kind of background which you get, you know, when the interpretation of CD99 is usually difficult, you know. Yes. DT, uh, nuclear positivity, it pops up, you know. The CD34 is usually good. CD99, you know, the problem is also with interpretation, yeah. So to make life easy for you, Dr. Noshin, because we have to come in and give you an answer, right? So, so I would go 20 is diffuse positive, TDT is negative, CD34 is negative. I would think of Burkitt's or some other high-grade B-cell lymphoma. Then I'll move on with this for the time, at least on okay. these things. Okay. And, uh, and but if you have flow, but if you have flow and kappa lambda is coming negative, then you can think about immaturity. If you had flow and then kappa lambda is coming, that should not happen, you know, to this. Okay. Uh, one more question is, WHO mentions that um, there is prognostic implication of morphological appearance of high-grade B-cell lymphomas. That is, either you have a diffuse large B-cell appearance or a blastoid appearance or intermediate between diffuse large B-cell and buckets. And it should be mentioned in a diagnostic comment, which we don't do that. So do you mention these morphological pattern in your diagnostic comment? Or, you know, I, I don't th see any significance. Of, I mean, how it has any prognostic implication? Um, in terms of treatment? Obviously, I, as I showed in my algorithm, I follow the rules usually, but I, I don't usually, you know, uh, I show you how I gave the final diagnosis. I usually do, unless it's a follicular lymphoma where I mention the patterns, but usually for these, I don't mention the patterns, at least, uh, you know, in my reports. Okay, and one more question, Arsalan, that immunohistochemical uh, markers, they are not uh, mm -hmm. molecular surrogates. So if we are calling it double expressor, it might not mm -hmm. be a double hit, right? If it's a triple yes, expressor, yes. it may not. 
So yes, is there yes, any yes. point of men since we are not practicing molecular at the moment? So is it wise to call it a double expressor or triple expressor? But it, because it may not be a double hit or a tri triple hit lymphoma. So is, is it wise to still write in the final diagnosis double expressor or triple expressor? You know what? Uh, in our hospital, we we are forcing our clinician. That's why we used to call it diffuse large vessel lymphoma, non-GC. And the reason you want to do is double express or triple because you want to ask him if somebody wants to get it done, you know, because they, you need to show the criteria also. If I don't mention it, then the clinician won't know whether CMIC was there or not. You have to tell him okay, whether this is a double expressor. It, it's up to him whether he wants to follow the rule. But recently, we are, because, you know, this is unfair to the physician, uh, to the patient also, leaving them, you know, halfway. So as a group, we have decided that we will not help the clinician. He'll have to get cytogenetics done. He should get it done. So we stick to high-grade B-cell lymphoma. We are not we're going to give them the differential. And, you know, you have to get it done, cytogenetics. We are forcing because we have introduced cytogenetics. And this is the right way to do. And triple expressor and double expressor may not... Uh, 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 may not be surrogates, but they still uh, can affect, uh, can show adverse or good prognosis also. And uh, if, I don't know whether Imran or Dr. Shahid can also comment on this, but uh, if somebody is diffused large B-cell lymphoma, whatever, whatever, and he's a double expressor versus not having that, they may uh, fare, uh, may have a bad prognosis actually. And, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah, so you have to show that. Can I agree with the salam? Uh, okay. uh, in our hospital, since you know, there's a lot of bone marrow transplants also going on, so they do ask us for as much specific diagnosis as possible. And then uh, we also have started uh, BCL2, BCL6, and CBIC on fish. So, and there are few patients, like, you know, this depends, of course, on affordability because these are a little expensive tests. But they have gone ahead and they, or, you know, it has, they have been confirmed as double or double. So one has to, I think, uh, yeah. narrow down. No, she can uh, As, as yes, mentioned, you know, the uh, correlation between ISC and FISH is uh, far from ideal. I think uh, a few years ago, we did a pilot study, you know, with molecular Tariq Mothar. And... Uh, I think uh, all, almost all the cases which were double expressor were negative. They were not showing any, you know, hit uh, on fish. However, vice versa, those who which are double hit or triple hit on fish, they are highly likely to show expression of uh, uh, CMIC or BCL2. However, great majority of double expressor are not double hit, right? Yeah. However, as uh, you might have noted in WHO, that they say that still uh, they lie between no hit uh, and uh, double hit. So double expressor have a kind of uh, survival or prognosis somewhere in between the yes. double hit and no hit so still we regularly you know whenever we are uh, requested to report this but using a strict criteria as uh, arsalan mentioned that semic more than 40 percent the the better is that if you have more than 70 percent of the uh, you know nuclei are positive uh, for semic uh, that is even more reliable because if you stay in randomly some lymphomas you know some mm -hmm. you will find in great majority of the lymphomas somehow right and pcl2 is strong diffuse positivity in more than 50 percent of the cells but most of the time when it comes positive it is usually positive diffuse you know as uh, arsalan showed the cases so still it has an importance and should be reported you know wherever uh, requested Nashin, can I quickly add something? Uh, it, it, we, we should, as a whole, since we have this platform, we should encourage clinicians because, you know, having a double head means uh, rituximab won't help the patient. So it is uh, very necessary to get these things done. 
you know, treatment completely changes. Whether I call it double edged pressure doesn't matter. At the end of the day, if cytogenetics is done and it comes out to be as a double head, then obviously everything, you know, they, they wait. I don't know whether what happens, but uh, previously, a few week, months ago, this used to go to Mayo. So, you know, you get your first. Uh, uh, cycle of chemo and he is waiting for the result for the for the next four to six weeks and if it comes out double hit then you remove it some app doesn't help you so you know we uh, as a group we should make sure cytogenetics has should be done that's true i absolutely <laughs> agree Arsalan. we are on the we are on the track so hopefully we are going to work, we are working on it. So hopefully we are going to start cytogenetics soon. Uh, I would request Inshallah. Dr. Imran, we are, we are aware that you have started Eber-ish uh, uh, recently. So I would like you to share your experience in terms of uh, your results, feasibility, validation of the e and cost effectiveness of Eber-ish. Yeah, it's a, uh, you know, it was a, uh, a very bold move. We started it, but it's very expensive. Uh, yeah. We have done. We have not done many tests. Uh, we uh, since we couldn't include this in our whole panel of immunohistochemistry, it is charged separately. Uh, mm -hmm. So, but we do recommend, like for example, recently we had a case of angioimmunoblastic composite with you know many large cells. So we were suspecting so there could be some you know composite large B cell EBV positive lymphoma. And then we had a plasma plastic lymphoma, so we recommended it, and it came back, and we, it was positive in both cases. Um, so um, I can't say, uh, you know, what's the trend so far? Whatever we have done is positive because we highly, highly, uh, you know, suspected, uh, or maybe the one or two were negative. Um, Shokat Khanum, I was talking to, you know, one of their hematopathologists. They are doing even ish through some other uh, vendor, and that is very, very cheap, and they, they are. I think that's included in, in their panel. So maybe once we, uh, I have approached that vendor as well. If we get a nice, uh, you know, price on that, then we will replace our current vendor with that one. So um, I mean, it it should be done. But um, the thing is, it's not like her to you where we start putting on the reports and every physician or every even a learned patient also realizes the importance of it. It's ish, Eberish is actually a diagnostic help to the pathologist. Mm -hmm. It's not a part of our treatment use. Right. Although eventually diagnosis, a better diagnosis leads to better, uh, better treatment. Mm -hmm. So let's see, it, 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 the price needs to come down. That's the bottom line. What is, what is like okay. price like? Thank you. you know? Know. <laughs> it's like 26,000 like 26, rupees. 26, oh. 27,000 rupees. Wow. Dr. Uzma also have a question. Um, she's asking, how can we differentiate between lymphocyte-rich Hodgkin lymphoma versus SLL with reed Sternberg cells? Lymphocyte-rich Hodgkin lymphoma versus? Versus uh, SLL with reed Sternberg cells. Yes. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, in... Uh, Obviously, in lymphocyte-rich Hodgkin's lymphoma, the background is mature lymphocytes. While in the case which I presented, uh, SLL with uh, Hodgkin cells, the background is SLL. So that is the most important uh, difference. Cells, you know, uh, not much inflammatory background very little inflammatory background uh, the lymphocyte rich mostly are nodular they do show nodular configuration uh, however i think the most important clue will be that uh, mature lymphocyte background versus cll background <laughs> Thank, thank you so much, sir. Uh, we do not have any more questions. Thank you, all of three of you, for joining us, for giving us such wonderful presentations. Um, Dr. Noshin, uh, I think I would like to add something. Dr. Dr. Hani and Navid, you have I'm... done a brilliant job, and we must all thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. So proactive, yeah, you know, and uh, I think we really enjoyed everything was hassle-free. 
and uh, we learned a lot and uh, very yeah. meticulously arranged you know very nice thank you yeah. thank you Noshin. Han, ha, we troubled hania so thank much thank you very much no problem sir thank you aap aapka bahut thank you thank you lot everyone dr hania dr Nashin. it was all pleasure it was all our pleasure so, thank you so much all the speakers and Hania so uh, Hania for arranging this session Dr. Shai, Dr. Khan I'm sorry for bothering you on the weekend we enjoy it we enjoy it we enjoy it we enjoy it if we are all sitting together so now we will see that Imran is at work so I am getting jealous jealous we are, we are. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you, inshallah, we look forward to have such more sessions in future. Thank you so much. Thank sure. you, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Allah Hafiz. Okay, Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz.